four Roman numeral cardinal. I don't know. I, <laughs> I thought, is, is that right? It's been, it's been a while. <laughs> um, we're going to get into Mendelian genetics and microbiology, uh, rise and fall of macro, evolution, life and legacy of Charles Darwin. We talked a little bit about this uh, last year. But, um, most of us have slept at least once since then, so we'll go over some of this stuff again. Now, <clears throat> Charles Darwin gets usually, oftentimes, made into one of three people, okay, uh, by the media, by biographies, whoever. Um, uh, most of the time, he's a brilliant scientist who contributes greatly to the advancement of life sciences. Which is kind of weird because his specialty was actually geology. Um, huh. Christians oftentimes will make him into, shall we say, the fundamentalists will oftentimes make him into an anti-religion atheist who hated Christians and campaigned against the church. Um, and sometimes they will go and make him into some kind of sniveling lightweight who didn't even have a doctorate for crying out loud and had serious doubts about his own theory, which he did have some. Um, every scientist does, every honest scientist does. Uh, some people say he recanted on his deathbed, reverted back to Christianity. That, n none of those are actually true. Okay, Darwin was none of the above, okay? <clears throat> 1809. Does that seem like a long time ago? Mm -hmm. Two centuries. Mm -hmm. In the grand scheme of things, it's not that long ago, but, you know, no electricity, pretty much, okay? Um, yeah, it was a long time ago, <laughs> in terms of, uh, we've what, we're uh, seven times the population that we were, as humans, uh, that we were back then. Uh, so, Darwin was born into a Christian family, his father is a successful doctor, as was his grandfather before that. It, although they were evolutionists, you don't want to hear about this, and they weren't necessarily public about it, okay? Because it wasn't the done thing, right? So his grandfather and his father are both evolutionists, or both kind of think that that's the way that things, um, that the life got here. But they're not public about it, and Darwin actually only learns about it from his grandfather. His father doesn't actually ever tell him any of this stuff, as far as I know. He reads a lot of his grandfather's notebooks. If you read his grandfather's notebooks, Darwin basically copied and pasted the theory of evolution um, from that, okay? Now, <clears throat> he attends Christ College in Cambridge, where he achieves his ordinary degree. Now, I've heard some Christians say, well, he had a degree in theology, which is not really true, okay? He went to a Christian college, listen, there weren't a lot of other options at the time. Not that that's a bad thing. Um, basically, he gets the only degree you can get that's related to science where you don't have to join the priesthood. So, yeah, it's been a long time ago, folks. Um, so, basically, prerequisite to a divinity degree without necessarily specific guidelines about what classes were required, okay? Um, if you look at his academic record. He <laughs> spends a lot of time hunting and shooting, being a gentleman. I uh, can't blame him for that. Um, running around, doing all the debate stuff. He takes a lot of science classes, especially later on in his academic career. Absolutely hates the medical sciences, right? His father wanted him to do that. His grandfather wanted him to do that. That's the family business, so to speak. But he cannot stand the sight of blood and decides to go and go collect beetles and stuff. Um, eventually, he specializes in geology, right? And that was his major focus as far as the most work that he did over his life and what he did for a living, that's eventually what he does. Uh, he never gets his doctorate. That is not to say that he's less intelligent or couldn't have gotten it or whatever. I'm just saying it never actually happened. Um, basically, he hangs out with the other scientists and just learns from them as much as he can, uh, which is not a bad plan. Uh, he scores a job on the HMS Beagle as a naturalist, pretty sweet gig, travels the world, all that stuff. Now, <clears throat> at the time, evolution is becoming a common-ish worldview in college, right? You got it in your debate classes. I kind of, I would compare it to kind of what homosexuality, the, the whole issue of, of homosexual marriage is now in America. It's kind of coming to the forefront, people are talking about it, or maybe five years ago, about, about that same kind of thing. It's not really, you know, everyone's like, what? No, oh, we keep talking about it. And then some people are like, no, 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 this is true. Yeah, anyway. So in 
So, uh, it's in his debate classes, several of his friends praise evolution. He already has kind of these ideas about it from his father, his grandfather, reading his journals and stuff. He's kind of shocked at the implications of the worldview. He's not ready to accept it. He engages in the debate. I'm very tempted to say that little Charlie Darwin says, all right, all right, I've had enough of this nonsense, all this, you know, blowing wind and these debate classes, nobody knows what they're talking about. I'm going to go out and find evidence for this thing, one way or the other. I think that's really what he decided he's going to do. And what he found, he didn't really want to share. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as we previously, previously discussed, Darwin's original theory was different than the one in biology today and Discovery Channel and all the media. Uh, Darwinism used as its mechanism for change, use and disuse. Okay. Scientists of his day had no clue how characteristics were passed down from parents to offspring. Okay, so he reasoned, all right, well, if you've got a horse thing that stretches its neck out in the span every day, over thousands of years, eventually you get a giraffe, which is, of course, ridiculous, because you're not changing the genetic information, right? They're gonna have, everybody's gonna have an average size neck, all right? So, I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, Mr. Cartwright. Darwin's theory only deals with life after it's kicking. Darwin talks about the origin of the species, right? This is not a really good title. He should have said the diversification of the species, and that's what he's really trying to talk about. Um, he doesn't talk about at all about the origins of life. He leaves that completely alone. It was intentional. For one thing, he didn't have a clue. He has no idea how life um, got here, and he didn't really think that he had to explain how life got here in the first place, because at the time, the idea of spontaneous generation is very common. Spontaneous generation, that's abiogenesis. Um, you know, the fleas hatched out of grains of sand. You know, if you leave a pile of garbage out, eventually it will turn into rats. No, you can go, go, go home and prove, I'll prove it to you. Just go set out a pile of garbage. After a week or two, there'll be rats there. And then obviously the garbage turned into rats, right? Well, people used to believe this, right? This was um, science <laughs> back in those days. It was slowly being eroded away at them, all right? Uh, Louis Pasteur and many other scientists are busy at the same time, right around 1857, okay, so Darwin publishes his book, finally, kind of reluctantly, 1859, because he doesn't want to get beat to it. Um, okay, so he's well into middle age at this point, um, <clears throat> especially for back then. You know, life expectancy was, what, 40? Um, <clears throat> so, at the same time, Louis Pasteur is busy going around demonstrating that life cannot come from non-living things. Okay, um, he gets real interested in it about 1857. This is a French guy. Darwin's an English guy. News travels slow. It's slow to be absorbed. People don't just don't jump to conclusions like they do today. Oh, you don't let your child sleep on its back. It's bad for them. <laughs> always, always. I remember hearing that. They were freaking out. The whole medical community was freaking out because we can't be letting these infants sleep on their backs. It's, they've got to be sleeping on their stomachs. And then like five years later, they were like, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> we were totally wrong about that. Always sleep them on their backs. Like, you guys are just making this up. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, so at that time, news traveled more slowly, and it, and it takes a while for this for um, Pasteur's experiments to kind of get out into the light, okay? Now, you're gonna meet with a term we call the resistance of the establishment in Cartwright classes if you go and propose an idea that is contrary to everyone's worldview, right? You challenge someone's worldview, they will react emotionally. Even men will, okay? Uh, now, Pasteur's ideas that spontaneous generation it can't, can't be done, it's impossible. That set him at odds with most of the scientific community, right? Half of them were already evolutionists. I would say half. We don't really know. A lot of them were. And they believed that life just sprung up, and then once life gets going, it's easy to just, you know, it just does stuff, it diversifies. So, <laughs> he's going around showing that spontaneous generation is impossible, you just sterilize it, ain't nothing gonna grow on it. Well, that set him at odds with most of the scientific community. Now, Pasteur was enough of a big shot that he's got a lot of followers, right? 
Because a lot of dudes really think he's cool and they follow in his footsteps and he's kind of, you know, like Darwin. They, they're hanging around with Pasteur because they don't want to hear what he has to say. And they, so he has a lot of supporters and there's a lot of debate um, and division. So much so that the French Academy of Sciences offers this prize. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. <laughs> if you're not going to make your language phonetic, just forget about it. Um, 2,500 francs, small fortune back in those days. Still not, not a bad sum of money. Uh, to anyone who could conclusively demonstrate that spontaneous generation either had happened or was impossible. All right, let's settle the debate. Let's get some evidence here. Okay, now, Pasteur tackled the challenge with his now famous experiment with swan necked flasks. Okay, so previously, Pasteur had taken a flask of, you know, animal broth or whatever and boiled it. Now, other scientists had done this and they would just barely get it up to a simmer and they take it off the heat, right? And of course, bacteria will grow in there because you have to boil it for a couple of minutes to absolutely kill everything totally dead, okay? So, um, and also, one of the things that they objected to as previous experiments was, well, you sealed the air off. Air is necessary for spontaneous generation. So he's like, all right, all right, all right, guys. We're gonna settle this once and for all. He boils this thing in a rolling boil for a good couple of minutes, and in this case, he has a specially designed neck on the flask so that dust particles and other crap can't get in here and carry with them the mold and the bacteria and stuff that's on just about every blood dust particle, right? So, get her up to a rolling boil, let it set, nothing happens. No spontaneous generation of microorganisms here, right? I understand that there is a museum in France that still has one of Pasteur's flasks that has no bacteria in it. <laughs> now, he did several of these. Um, in others, he would, okay, he would leave them out for a while, see, nothing's happening. And then he would break the uh, net off of the flask, and what do you know, 24 hours later, bacteria. Like, they would say, oh, well, you just, you destroyed the broth, and so no, the, now you've made the broth unable to spontaneously generate. No, 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 it's still perfectly capable of growing bacteria. All you gotta do is introduce bacteria into the media, voila, okay? And you don't even have to break the tip, uh, the neck off, you just swish it up here and expose it to the air for a little while, it will, again, grow bacteria. He demonstrated so convincingly uh, that spontaneous generation was impossible <laughs> that he won the prize money in 1862. So he has demonstrated that this is impossible, you cannot get life from non-living things. And he was pretty proud of himself. Is he the doctor that realized that you can, you have to have sterile conditions for operating and all of that? He um, initially advocated the idea of preventing infection right. by sterilizing your equipment and preventing, okay, so if infections are caused by bacteria and mold and whatever else, um, germs, you know, he was a proponent of germ theory, right. one of the first guys about it, then you ought to be able to prevent those things from getting to your patient and therefore no infection. There was a movie on that. Joseph, yeah. Joseph uh, Lister was one of the first, so he was a physician, but again, he's got a lot of followers, a lot of influence, they start hearing about this and we'll look in the area, and Joseph Lister um, promotes sterilization of equipment, starts spreading the, the news, and of course he sterilized his equipment in an alcohol solution that we now call Listerine, right? So, anyway, uh, <clears throat> so Louis Pasteur was pretty proud of himself. He was, he was kind of a proud guy, you know? What can you say? Smartest guy in the country of France, which is the center of the world at that time. You, you're gonna have a little bit of a big head. It's just getting ahead. But. So what he said about it, is never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal, mortal blow of this simple experiment. There is no known circumstance in which it can be confirmed that microscopic beings came into the world without germs, without parents similar to themselves. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, nothing has changed in 150 years since then, as far as I know. So the microscopes they had by that time, could they observe? This is about it. This is about as, as advanced as you can get. And it, again, it, their world is so different from ours that it's difficult for us to imagine what it was like 
when most people have never seen a microscope. Um, but this is about the best that they had. Microscopes, as I understand it, were still, the lenses were still ground by hand and built by professionals. So, extremely expensive. You know, just read into that, extremely expensive at the time, you know, when, when people weren't as wealthy because there were a seventh as many of us. So, not, a, not very many people have seen actual living things under a microscope. Lots of them have seen drawings and stuff, of course, like, and things like that. But this is about it. So, you got a nucleus, you got some cytoplasm, you got some specks. It's very easy for us to, I don't know, understand where they're coming from um, and say, okay, okay, if this is all you know about a cell, eh, maybe we can forgive you for thinking that it just comes from non-living things because there's not a lot here, right? About 250 times magnification. This is the limit of cellular knowledge at the time of Darwin. Excuse me. Now, at the time, of Pasteur, and even to the present, believe it or not. Okay, Pasteur's experiments don't convince everyone, they don't convince everyone immediately, right? And many claim that, wow, you know, millions of years ago, conditions on the Earth were way different, right? So spontaneous generation is possible, you know, millions of years ago. And of course, it's one of those things, okay, I can't distribute because I don't know the conditions of the Earth, or the Earth neither do you. I wasn't there. Um, but I can show you that it's been possible in you know, all of the above situations. <laughs> That's about all we got. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about abiogenesis here in a couple or three slides. We have come a long way, baby, in our understanding of the cell. This is about the limit of an optical microscope, okay? You wanna go out and plunk down 35 grand on a Zeiss microscope, it's a you know, dark field or something like that, you can see a cell in about this much detail. Or you can watch videos of a guy who does them on YouTube for free. <laughs> uh, Greg Smith has some absolutely mind-boggling videos of bacteria and uh, paramecium and euclinas and all kinds of uh, delphinias, rotifers, uh, that we watch in biology. And of course, this is what we show our biology students, right? You know, you've got all kinds of stuff going on here. The Golgi body, you use modified proteins and collect stuff to excrete to the membrane. You've got your mitochondrions. You've got uh, lysosomes that are responsible for digesting fats. And, and uh, of course, the nucleus and the nucleolus and the chromatin, where, where most of the DNA is. And this is where, how it actually figures out which DNA to copy and which DNA not to copy. We don't have a clue how it does that. <coughs> you've got your nuclear envelope, nuclear membrane. Um, maybe some microvilli or some cilia or a flagellum to uh, propel itself and get from place to place. All kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, centriole with these weird looking little filaments that go to the cell walls. You know, <clears throat> if you look up detailed view of a cell on Google, you'll get a lot of images like this. But it is now impossible for us to demonstrate everything that we know about a cell in a single picture. Okay? So. <clears throat> We're going to start at the bottom and kind of work our way up, okay, with these structures, right? So we're going to start with amino acids. And the whole point of us doing this is to kind of show how complicated living things really are, all right? <clears throat> so amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So if a protein is a school, an amino acid is a brick, all right? First, lysine. And, of course, we remind ourselves that this is not what lysine looks like, okay? Lysine does not have an image. Everything that you are familiar with has an image. You can think of what it looks like. This does not look like anything. This molecule is smaller than a visible wavelength of light. Your eyeball needs thousands of wavelengths of light to create an image. So that there, there is no image here. We can calculate with a very high degree of accuracy what its structure is, but we're looking at a skeleton here, folks. I mean, this is not, I mean, if I, if we could build a model that would account for all the known properties of an atom, and well, we'll see a little bit about of that you know, here, here in a few slides. Now, drawing a structure like this, especially if you're somebody like me that can't draw to save his life, is very difficult. So oftentimes, scientists will draw the little stick figures here, right? And you got your nitrogens and your oxygens over here, and every joint, since carbon is so common, uh, we don't even draw the carbon in there. We just make a little bend in the structure where the carbons are 
all the chemists in the room go, oh, so there's a carbon right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. You get, you get the idea, they're everywhere. Okay, now, that's one amino acid. These are all 20 of them. You got your non-polar and polar uh, amino acids, and then you have those that are electrically charged being either acidic or basic, all right? Just to show you that these things are very different from each other, okay? So you can't just substitute lysine for um, cytosine, it, it doesn't work that way. You must have the correct amino acid or it won't work. <clears throat> these are the bricks, they must be arranged in a specific order if you are going to make a specific protein. For example, ribonuclease. Ribonuclease is the smallest known protein, made up of only 17 of the 20 amino acids. Uh, arranged in a chain 124 amino acids long. Most proteins are hundreds of amino acids long, some of them are thousands. Some of them are so large that they are actually made in pieces, which are then fitted together in the Golgi bodies. All right? Uh, so it is folded, it is modified. You've got two or three or four or 25,000 different proteins in your body, which are then modified to do the various tasks that your cell needs. How it knows what to do to them is beyond the science. We do not know why. This is again, maybe a little bit more accurate because we're kind of representing the electron cloud here a little bit. Okay, it's not what an electron cloud looks like. Um, we'll, we'll see some electron clouds in the next PowerPoint. All right. Uh, so this is ribonuclease. Uh, in this in this image, it's bound to a transfer RNA, which I think is this thing. I'm not sure. Um, but you can see there's a lot of complication here. And we can't just go in and push buttons and, and flip switches on this thing, okay? It, do, it is very specific. You know, if I swap these two things around, the thing doesn't work, right? That, let's say it was insulin. Let's say you built yourself an insulin molecule, which would be many times larger than this. And you went in and went, whoopsie, doesn't work. Now you got type one diabetes. Diabetes. <laughs> um, you have to have a specific structure. Uh, function follows form in biology, okay? Meaningful structure requires information. Okay, so, so enough about the uh, amino acids. That's maybe, maybe a little bit much for our brains to be wrapping around on a Wednesday evening. But we're all familiar with the difference between a random pattern and an organized pattern, aren't we? I mean, that's obvious to us. We can look and see design. <laughs> I had to a little bit of an argument this week on Facebook. Um, I said, uh, if you have to explain to me why it's art, then it's not. And that may you know, have hurt some people's feelings. I don't really care if it hurts your feelings. It's true. And I, if I look at it and be like, that's not art. You're like, oh, yes, it is, because it represents my feelings. I don't care what it represents. It's not organized. I, I saw some art at the... Um, Oh, whatever, the, Oklahoma, the museum in Oklahoma City with all the Chihuly and stuff. A um, bunch of beams just thrown together. It looks like construction debris. Now, I'm not trying to insult the artist, because I'm sure he worked really hard on it, but it um, looks like that. <laughs> if I just poured some glue on that and tried to sell it on eBay, how much is it worth? But it represents my feelings. <laughs> okay. Uh, meaningful structure requires information. And all of us can tell the difference, and I can tell, even if I had no idea what a Millennium Falcon was or what Star Wars was, I had no idea about space travel, I could look at that and go, yeah, that's pretty cool, right? And my nerd, part of my brain would start firing up and be like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? You gotta have information. <clears throat> so where does this information come from? Why, the genetic code, of course. But in Darwin's day, science had no idea how characteristics were passed from parents to offspring. Right? We discussed this. Various theories and speculations on this subject are actually kind of hilarious. <laughs> if you go back and read some of them, and there were, and this is this is a great example of men being men, right? There were all kinds of scientists, no evidence, but they were all very sure that they were right. Uh, there were scientists who were that absolutely certain that the male contributes all the characteristics to his offspring, and the female has nothing to do with it. She's just, you know, like clay. And then, the male just molds that clay in any way that he wants, and 
how they explain why daughters take after their moms is beyond me, but you know, they were a lot more French. Yeah. What are you gonna do? What um, the fact of the matter is, and, oh, some of them either gave, uh, cre gave complete credit to the mother. Now oh, she's carrying this child in her womb for nine months. Sorry, actually nine months, it's ten months, right? It's 40 weeks. I heard moms, but that's the longest nine months of my life. Well, yeah, it was more like ten months, actually. Forty weeks, but oh, I don't mind still calling it nine months. It's not, it's ten months. <clears throat> so, very few of them actually hit close to the mark. We have a contribution from both parents that he's equal. And <laughs> not in physical effort, maybe, but yeah. genetically, <laughs> genetically, the contribution is almost exactly equal. Mom gives mitochondrial DNA, so I guess she still has a leg up there. Um, so, physical characteristics oftentimes do not get passed down in a way that makes sense. And we've all experienced this, haven't we? You look at a nice family and there's that one kid, you're like, what happened to you? <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> But it does have, you know, <laughs> characteristics. Um, yeah, it's it's weird, you know. Um, my my dad has brown eyes. My mom has blue eyes, right? So we understand that brown eyes are dominant and better as far as being able to see. Um, but all of us kids, except I have five uh, five of us biological siblings, and only one of us has brown eyes. The rest of us have blue eyes. So trying to figure out how, in the name of logic and reason, these characteristics get passed on. Uh, is not something that science is able to figure out until the genius of Gregor Mendel. Now, uh, he was born Johann Mendel in 1822 to a farming family. His father taught him the art of selective breeding, plant grafting, uh, skills that are going to serve him well in his scientific career. Uh, his genius so impresses his middle school teachers, which was the only school that was free back in those, free back in those days. They implored his parents to put him in high school. High school was not free back then, nor should it be today. That, I'm sorry, was that out loud? Um, <laughs> <sighs> don't get me started. <laughs> uh, they employed his parents to put him in high school. High school was a big deal, it was expensive, it was college preparatory, and it was nothing else. Um, parents couldn't afford it. They did it anyway. I think they recognized that Mandela had some serious abilities here. Uh, so they put him in high school. Times he nearly starves to death because he cannot afford food. Eventually, his younger sister gives up her dowry, basically giving up her marriage ability, so that he can finish high school. Um, and after graduating, he become he attempts to become a teacher and fails. Wait a minute, he's fresh out of high school. Yeah, back then high school education was a really big deal. I mean, you know, high school diploma that has monetary value. Not anymore. Sorry to try to offend you. I just that's just the facts. Um, so, tries to become a teacher, he fails. Uh, so then he joins the Augustinian Monastery of St. Thomas in what is now Borno. I had no idea how to pronounce it. I'm not even going to try it. Again, they're like, oh, you have a high school diploma. Well, come right on. Right? No question about admissions or anything like that. Uh, it was well known for scientific pursuit of knowledge and all that stuff. High degree of scholarship. And once he gets there, he again attempts to become a teacher. At a college, he's fresh out of high school. He does this was not uncommon. Again, high school education was uh, just go read some of those exit exams. All right, you want to get a diploma? Here's your exam. I think probably all of us would fail. Okay, it was different knowledge back then. I get that, but wow, the level of detail. So he again attempts to become a teacher. He fails. But one of the examiners is like, you know what, Kit, I really like your style. I'm going to pull some strings. I'm going to pull some favors, call us favors. And we're going to get you into the University of Vienna. Wow. That was like the greatest college on the face of the earth. Doppler taught there, taught physics. At this time, Mendel actually sits under Doppler in that physics class. That's actually what it's his favorite subject. So, he graduates from the University of Vienna and tries and fails for the third time to be a teacher because he has too much original thought. Um, I would have failed too if that was a requirement. Anyway, so he settles down and he's like, all right, fine. I'm going to do experiments and I'm going to figure out this whole genetic thing. You can call it genetics. He starts his work by establishing populations of pea plants that breed true. Tall plants that always reproduce and give rise to tall plants. So there's no trickery here. You know exactly what you're going to get. 
when these plants are um, raising a, or uh, giving rise to the next generation. Okay. After he gets these populations established, he crosses them. Crosses talls with shorts, wrinkled peas with smooth peas, green bods with yellow bods, and so on and so forth. He's got probably half a dozen different traits that he's looking at. Okay. And you notice that all of them only have one characteristic. All of them are tall, or they're all wrinkled peas, or they're all yellow pods, or purple flowers, or whatever. And then, and then he allows these hybrid plants, that he, he, he has this inkling, okay, well, I don't think that information disappeared. I think it's still there. So we're just going to let these guys self-pollinate hundreds of plants, right? He's, he's using here. And so when this happens, in all cases, he gets 75% of the offspring that still have the original trait, let's say, let's say they were tall, uh, and 25% had a trait from their grandparents that skipped a generation, quote unquote. Okay. He figures out, now if you'd have given me this data, I'd be like, huh, okay, <laughs> I don't know what, what's uh, going on here, something weird. Gregor fig figures it out, figures out that each individual gives two traits to their, or excuse me, each individual has, I should say, two traits, and for each trait there's a dominant and a recessive gene. Uh, Mom and dad only do donate one trait to kiddo. So, takes the scientific community by storm, right? No. Uh, Mandel publishes his work. You know, like, oh, oh, that's, that's great. You know, another study on hybridization. Well, <laughs> I don't know if we have room up here. Uh -huh. I guess we'll put it right here. <clears throat> right? It gets shoved among dozens of other hybridization studies, completely unappreciated until the early 1900s. At that time, evolution has been taught for half a century, um, in, even in America. Mandel himself is distracted by other, other things, spends the rest of his life fighting against government control and over taxation and standing for religious freedom, one of my heroes. So, when this comes out, that you cannot influence the characteristics you pass on to your kiddos, it's set. Your genetic code cannot be changed except by mutations. Um, evolution has a really big problem, okay? The only way that they knew about to change the genetic code was mutation. So that becomes the new evolutionary mechanism because there's no other choice. If you're going to modify information you pass on from parents to offspring, it has to be through mutation. That's it. That's the only choice. Right? So neo-Darwinism, or evolution by mutation, was born. Now I'm about to kill it. Um, we've looked at this last year. We have tested this idea that mutations can give rise to um, new traits, right? Uh, fruit flies, for example, are a great, uh, what we call model organism in biology, right? Because they have short lifespans, you don't have to feed them a lot, um, high reproductive rates, so mom and dad have 100 kids, let's say, a thousand, I don't know. Um, so they're easy to do experiments on, and Especially uh, genetic experiments, because because of their uh, sh the short period of time it takes them to reproduce. I think it only takes them a couple of weeks to get yourself a new generation. So, um, one of the things that the evolutionists are trying to do here, they, they have uh, tried to purposefully mutate each core gene involved in fruit fly development. So it's not a random, you know, just blasting of X-rays and see what happens. Um, they singled out each, gen each gene that's responsible for development of specific traits in fruit flies and mutated each and every one of them. And they were very thorough about this. All right. Um, this is a classic work. The authors won the Nobel Prize in 95. It was published in Nature, one of the most prestigious science journals in the world. The experiments prove that the mutation of any of these core developmental genes, mutations that would be essential if you were going to evolve into something else, Merely resulted in dead or deformed flies. Most of them died. But they got all kinds of flies. Really, they got some flies with white eyes, some flies with red eyes. They got flies with really hairy eyes. They got flies with lots of hair. They got flies with uh, feet for antenna and weird looking mandibles. And 
Um, they got flies with no wings, which I guess you would have to call a land. That's not a fly anymore. Um, <laughs> they got all kinds of horrible things that they did to these flies, and most of them died, okay? Um, the guy in charge of the experiment finally said, you know what, I, I think fruit flies have reached the limit of their evolutionary potential. They cannot evolve into something else. Or maybe you cannot evolve by mutation. Did that ever occur to you? <laughs> uh, well, fruit flies just, you know, we just can't see enough life history with the fruit flies. I mean, sure, we did 600 generations, but that's not enough. <laughs> really? <clears throat> well, let's pick a different organism. Well, let's pick on a bacteria. You can get a population of bacteria in about a day from a handful, right? a handful of individuals, plus poor kids allergic to science. Um, uh, they have uh, tracking, been tracking uh, back these particular bacteria for 20 years, approximately 40,000 generations. In the end, the species that they started with was hobbled by accumulated mutations. How does that happen? Well, mutations are usually recessive. See, so if you have a mutation, you probably are, are okay because you still have a good gene, and that good gene will express itself. For example, let's say you have a mutation that would cause you to build an improper insulin molecule, insulin protein, and, and you wouldn't be able to digest sugar properly. Well, you may have that mutation, and you, by the way, you can go get tested with this if you want, um, but you're probably fine because, for, for, for one thing, the mutation would be very rare, and, so, and it's recessive, so you probably have a good set of that gene, and you're fine. Right? And you'll be able to make insulin just like everybody else. However, if you marry somebody who has that same mutation, again, not very common, and you have a bunch of kids, those kids are going to have a 25% chance that they will get the mutated gene from mom and a mutated gene from dad. They will, be, they will have type 1 diabetes. Okay? Um, so you understand, the more common that mutation is, the more carriers there are. They're everywhere. And the more you mutate the species, whatever you're mutating, the more genes they're going to have like that. It's not just going to be insulin. Now you're going to have you know, muscular atrophy and all of the uh, you know, cancers and all of these different problems, genetic problems, that are going to accumulate in your population over time. And this is happening with humans. You know, right now, the Lord tarries, I mean, we'll have way more mutations in our, in our gene pool as humans a thousand years from now than we, than we do today. It's just a fact. Okay, so as you mutate these guys, the genome is really suffering. The gene pool is not liking this. You are polluting the water. Okay, and uh, this is a quote from one of the evolutionists. Let's see, University of Bristol. Uh, emeritus professor of bacteriology, Alan Linton, summarized the situation. Where is the experimental evidence? None exists in the literature claiming that one species has been shown to evolve into another. Bacteria are the simplest form of independent life, ideal for this kind of study you can generate, uh, that is, you can get a generation of, of uh, bacteria in 20 to 30 minutes, an entire population of them after 18 hours. There are billions of individuals on a little petri dish, Right? Throughout 150 years of the science of bacteriology, going back to Pasteur, there is no evidence that one species of bacteria has changed into another in spite of the fact that populations have been exposed to potent chemical and physical mutagens, physical being like x-rays, chemical being like, you know, um, all kinds of nasty stuff that, that can produce uh, mutations. And also, uniquely, bacteria possess extra chromosomal, extra chromosomal, excuse me, transmissible plasma. So they can actually exchange DNA with each other if one of them. So, so if one of them did make a mutation that was beneficial, it would spread throughout the population. Theoretically. Since there is no evidence for species changes between the simplest forms of unicellular life, it is not surprising that there is no evidence for evolution between prokaryotic, that is, a cell without a nucleus to eukaryotic cells, let alone throughout the whole array of multicellular organisms. Traps the microbe. 
I didn't say it. He said it. So, we have tested this idea that mutations can cause evolution, and uh, yeah, they cannot. So, what are genes anyway? Well, again, these are stick figures, skeletons, um, of the actual molecule, but each joint here represents a carbon atom. The, uh, some places you see two lines, that's a double bond. And so you've got your carbons here, you've got your oxygen, your nitrogen, hydrogen, so on and so forth. Um, let's see, other, the other atoms besides carbons are labeled. These molecules stack up, so the adenines bond together with the thymines, hydrogen bonds, which are strong, yet not that strong. You can take them apart without doing too much damage to these individual molecules. So they're bonded together, and these guys are bonded together, and one will be stacked on top of the other, and you'll make this giant, well, let me show you. Um, you make this giant double helix that we're familiar with as DNA. Now, uh, and again, this is a slightly more accurate picture of what we're looking at. The white spheres are hydrogens, the blue ones are nitrogens, the reds oxygen, the grayish, blackish is carbon, the yellow is phosphorus. Um, what else do I want to say about this? So this is, this is how your body codes for proteins stored in the DNA, okay? Now you're looking at gosh, probably thousands of atoms, but you only have in this picture one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, fifteen base pairs or so. So if you have a genome of billions, I think it's roughly three billion base pairs, you get an idea of just how much DNA there is in your cells. And if that's not enough for you, every single cell in your body has all of the DNA necessary to make you. And somehow it knows which, which genes it's supposed to copy and which genes it's not. Right? So you don't go making enamel on your skin. It doesn't happen because your skin cells are like, that's ridiculous, why do I do that with skin cell, bro? Hello? I make skin cell stuff. Enamel? You're going to have to go up to the mouth to do, to do that. Okay. Uh, so the right proteins are made in the right times at the right quantities. You go mixing that up, that's a direct recipe for cancer. Right? And everybody has cancer. It's just that your immune system usually kills off those cells. All right? When your immune system gets to a weak enough point or your cancer cells get to a high enough population, that's when you start having problems. And cancer is nothing more than a cell that's going through an identity crisis because it has no idea which proteins it's supposed to make and which proteins it's not supposed to make. So what does it do? It goes crazy! It makes everything! And so in a tumor you'll see hair and teeth and weird, weird stuff. It demands resources from the body, eventually crowds out your body's organs, you die of organ failure. Ugh. Anyway, so the A's, T's, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, make up a code for a protein. Proteins are made up of similar molecules to um, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, uh, known as amino acids. Again, these guys have to be arranged in just the right order. Three letters in the DNA code for each amino acid. For example, alanine is coded G, C, C. That makes sense. Yeah. So you've got plenty of, you've got plenty of room in your, um, with your four possible choices to code for all 20 amino acids. Okay, some amino acids can be coded for by more than one code, believe it or not. So who wrote this code? Oh, well, it just looks like it was written. It wasn't actually written, right? Nobody wrote it. Uh, it just gives the appearance of design. So, and, and again, we, we kind of hinted at this uh, last year. So how possible is it to generate a specific code by a random process? How long would it take for a million monkeys on a million typewriters to reproduce the works of Shakespeare? Right? Evolutionists would have us believe that eventually it's going to happen. Right? Although I think the internet should have disproved that by now. Oh my God! Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so let's start small with this calculation here. So if you're going to, if you have a system and you want to know how many different ways there are of arranging that system. You have to do a, fact, a calculation called factorial. Okay, you have to multiply all of the whole integers between 
one and that number, and that will tell you how many different ways you have it of arranging a specific system. Okay. So if we have three Legos or three markers that are all different colors, arranging them from point A to point B, we have three factorial, that's what this little exclamation point means, of arranging one times two times three is six. Again, that's using the old math. All right. Um, now, if you have five Legos, you have increased the complexity of your system. We now have five factorial ways of arranging them. This is not so complicated, right? Um, one times two times three times four times five. That's so bad. 120. 120 different, way, different ways of arranging a system with five different parts. Okay. If we have ten parts, you have three and a half million, over three and a half million different ways of arranging them. This number is growing fast. It, it grows faster than any other function except for a double exponent. Um, and there's probably functions that grow faster than a double exponent. I don't know. I'm minored in math and I barely made it through there. Okay, now, if you have 50 different people, you don't have to take my word for it. You know, if you take your, your phone calculator and you turn it sideways, there's a little button on it that says X factorial. That's a little exclamation point. So you can put in 10 factorial and it'll spit out 3.6 million. You can put in 50 factorial and it'll spit out 3.04 times 10 to the 64th power. Eventually it'll get mad at you though. <laughs> Because it cannot calculate. Um, yeah, so I put this one into my parents' computer when I was uh, in college. They have a, they had a really old computer running on Windows 95, I think. Uh, crashed the computer. <laughs> 100 factorial. It could not compute. <laughs> I was like, oops. <laughs> I, I, I just didn't think about it. It's a lot of numbers, man. One times two times three times four times five. All the way to 100. Um, so, you have nearly 10 to the 158th power different ways of arranging a system of 100 pieces. The number of atoms in the observable universe is approximately 10 to the 80th power. Right? So this is an unfathomably large number. It is beyond human comprehension. I cannot explain to you how big, I have tr enough trouble explaining to you how big the universe is. Right? I don't fully understand it. It's huge. Okay? If we think of a simple <laughs> system, like a human skeleton that has around 200 bones, you start to get an appreciation. Okay, you throw a, a uh, you know, do-it-yourself plastic skeleton into the dryer, which you can order on eBay. You throw one of those into the uh, dryer with a little glue, and you run it on high. How long is it going to be before you get a human hand out of that? will never happen. We actually have in mathematics ways of describing how probable or improbable something is. If you see a number that's 10 to the 50th power probability, one chance in 10 to the 50th power, mathematics would say that it has probably never happened in the entire history of the universe. In other words, they're pretty, they're pretty sure it has never happened. <laughs> you see a number of 10 to the 100th power, that technically is mathematically impossible. In other words, to argue the opposite, I mean, say, oh, well, it's perfectly possible to build this, and uh, no, no, as a matter of fact, um, we're most definitely sure that has never happened in the entire history of the universe. It's just, now if you talk about all the impossible interactions between all the atoms in all the universe for all the time, even if you believe time is 13 and a half billion years or so, it's just impossible. Okay? So, let's apply this to a protein. Back to ribonuclease. Uh, in ribonuclease, we only have 17 out of the 20 parts. Okay, so we're trying to be nice to the evolutionists. Okay? Chance of getting the first amino acid correct is pretty good. You know, one chance is 17. Well, that's probably happened in the entire history of the universe, right? Getting two in a row correct. One chance is 17 times 17, which is 289. Chances of getting three in a row correct are almost five, one in 5,000. If you work this out to the 124th amino acid, you don't have to take my word for it, you can go home and study it for yourselves, you will find that you have one chance in 10 to the 152nd power of getting lysine assembled correctly. But Mr. Cartwright, you made it too easy for the evolutionists. I know. I, we're assuming that amino acids built themselves. 
or are eternal, which I can probably prove to you is impossible. We are assuming that amino acids coincide in time and space. Okay, and that you have plenty of them to work with. We are assuming that amino acids do not destroy themselves, no matter how many times you take them apart and put them back together, which defies the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, <laughs> um, we are assuming you have some way of putting them together and taking them back apart. Which again, amino acids don't usually do that. They will form larger molecules, but they will look anything like proteins. Uh, so again, this is an unfathomably large number, right? If you if, if instead of space, we had matter instead, if we filled the entire known universe with nothing but atoms, right, the average concentration of atoms in the universe is like 14 atoms per cubic yard, including all the stars and all the galaxies and everything. If you average it out, it's, it's a more perfect vacuum than anything we can create on the Earth. It's space, okay? Scientists are not very creative. They call it what it is. <laughs> if you, instead of space, if you had matter, you'd have 10 to the 120th atoms in the observable universe, 13 and a half billion light years in both directions. So if you had 10 universes filled with atoms, you'd have 10 to the 121st power atoms. If you have 100, you have 10 to the 122nd power. If you have 10 billion universes filled with atoms, you have 10 to the 130th, is that right, power atoms. You have not gotten close to this number yet. You understand why mathematicians have always been skeptical of evolution? Well, they have good reasons for this. Okay? This is approximately 50 orders of magnitude beyond a mathematical improbability, and we're talking about the smallest protein, we're talking about one protein, and we already made the argument way too easy for the evolutionists by assuming all that stuff we talked about. This is far short of a collection of large proteins and way simpler than the least complicated living thing that we know of. And of course, we all know Mr. Cartwright's favorite scientific image is that of a ribosome. <laughs> ah, doesn't just nourish your soul, man. That's art. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got two large uh, substructures here, every little sphere represents an atom, and once again, you go switching these bad boys around, and no point in a situation, the ribosome doesn't work, okay, and these guys are responsible for building everything else in the cell. And where do they come from? They come from ribosomes, of course, ribosomes make ribosomes, and only ribosomes can make ribosomes. Yeah, believe it or not, We've gotten so fancy with our computer modeling, we can actually animate this process. So, prepare to be amazed. Does this through. make you really happy to watch that? Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I think she has useful things to say, so. So that six feet of this long molecule fits into the microscopic nucleus of every cell. Let's see it a little bit better. The process starts when DNA is wrapped around special protein molecules called histones. The combined loop of DNA and protein is called a nucleosome. So these are structures similar to the ribosome, but in this case we're just looking at the electron density. into a thread. The end result is a fiber known as chromatin. So you get an idea of how complicated all of these atoms are, all these molecules this are. This fiber is then looped and coiled yet again. Separated. 
Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. Again, we can't represent the complexity the of these structures. We know how they behave. Machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The whirling uh, blue molecular machine is It spins the just DNA wait, just, just as fast as a jet here. engine <laughs> as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. <coughs> One strand is copied continuously Scattered. and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. DNA is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules. Now I'm going to take that DNA and make it useful. What you are about to see is DNA's most extraordinary secret. How a simple code is turned into flesh and blood. It begins with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene. Again, this is how it knows which gene, which uh, proteins to make. A gene is simply a length of DNA instruction stretching away to the left. The assembled factors trigger the first phase of the process, reading off the information that will be needed to make the protein. Everything is ready to roll. Three, two, one, go. Activation. The blue molecule racing along the DNA is reading the gene. It's unzipping the helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain snaking out of the top is a <laughs> copy of the genetic message, it's and it's made of a close chemical cousin yeah. of DNA. There's RNA. five or six thousand of these in every single cell in the body. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to copy the A's, C's, T's, and G's of the gene. Very high degree of accuracy. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related building block known as U. Watching this process called transcription in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in your body. It doesn't just float around. It has to be complete. transported. It snakes out into the outer part of the cell. We delete details just to. Then, in a dazzling so display of choreography, all the components of a molecular machine lock together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a ribosome. Oh, yes. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids are the small red tips attached to the transfer molecules. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids. Each transfer molecule carries a three-letter code that is matched with the RNA in the machine. Now we come to the heart of the process. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off, three letters at a time, and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. Genius. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid it carries is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. And after a few seconds, the assembled protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make any kind of protein. It just depends what genetic message you feed in on the RNA. In this case, the end product is hemoglobin. The cells in our bone marrow churn out a hundred trillion molecules of it per second. Per second! And as a result, 
Our muscles, brain, and all the vital organs in our body receive the oxygen they need. simplified process. We deleted all kinds of stuff from that process just so we could fit it into a video that is easy, easy to digest. There's all kinds of stuff, extra stuff that happens, more proteins that are involved. Uh, for example, there's a protein that goes along and proofreads the copy DNA, making sure that it's accurate. I don't know how it does that, but it does. Um, there are proteins, mo little motor proteins, specifically designed to transport all this stuff back and forth from the nucleus to the rest of the cell. Because right? there's no ribosomes in the nucleus. And you make 100 trillion molecules of hemoglobin every second. So there are 100 trillion ribosomes right now, and all they're doing is cranking out hemoglobin to replace, I mean, you get a new set of, a, new, a whole new um, <clears throat> set of red blood cells every, what, three weeks-ish? That was the simplified version, okay? <laughs> this, this is um, closer to the real thing, except all the other stuff in the cell is deleted. So we're just looking at the proteins that are involved in a specific process, and that is the process of how a leukoplast, which is part of your, or your immune system, that's it's the process of how it rolls along the edge of your blood cell and finds um, infections. Uh, so it will go to inflamed tissue and squeeze its way out of the uh, out of your blood vessels and into the infected tissue, and it knows how to do that because of this process. Okay, so this is one process that involves a gazillion proteins, and we've deleted everything else in the cell just so we can understand this. Okay. Our heads don't explode. And I don't pretend to understand everything that's going on here, okay? <laughs> uh, just FYI. Okay. Hopefully we Is it possible for a rich, thick lotion to be non greasy? <sighs> yep. We're debating the origins of the universe, and this guy's talking about lotion. <laughs> At least it's a man, not a woman, right? I don't know. <laughs> Boy, I always feel weird when a woman is putting on lotion in front of me. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Can't you do that somewhere else? Cells roll slowly on endothelial cells. E selectins on endothelial cells interact with PSGL1, a glycoprotein on leukocyte microvilli. So this is a close in leukocyte edge of the uh, blood vessel. While new ones are formed. Like Velcro. These interactions are possible because the extended extracellular domains of both proteins emerge from the extracellular matrix, which covers the surface of both cell types. There you go. It's like an alien world. It is an alien world. The outer leaflet of the lipid bilayer is enriched in sphingolipid-rich sphingolipid rafts raised above the rest of the leaflet recruit specific membrane proteins. Rats' rigidity is caused by the tight packing of cholesterol molecules against the straight sphingolipids hydrocarbon chains. So you do need cholesterol. Outside the rats, kinks in the saturated hydrocarbon chains and lower cholesterol concentration result in increased fluidity. At sites of inflammation, secreted chemokines bound to heparin sulfate proteoglycan on endothelial cells are presented to leukocyte 7 transmembrane receptors. The binding stimulates leukocytes and triggers an intracellular cascade of signaling reactions. You have a bunch of the chemical signals here. It's a very different composition than that of the outer leaf. While some proteins traverse the membrane, others are either anchored into the inner leaflet by covalently attached fatty acid chains or are recruited through non covalent interactions with membrane proteins. The membrane-bound protein complexes are critical for the transmission of signals across the plasma membrane. Beneath the lipid bilayer, spectrum tetramers arranged into a 
and second on that word. This is the highway. This nets also structural brain skeleton that contributes to membrane stability and membrane protein. And they have a specific way they build it. The cytoskeleton is comprised of networks of filamentous proteins that are responsible for the special organization of cytosolic components. Inside microvilli, actin filaments form tight parallel bundles which are stabilized by cross-linking proteins. While vapor in the cytosol, the actin network adopts a gel-like structure, stabilized by a variety of actin-binding proteins. Filaments, capped at their minus ends by a protein complex, grow away from the plasma membrane by the addition of actin monomers to their plus end. The actin network is a very dynamic structure, with continuous directional polymerization and disassembly. Polarization meaning it lengthens. Severing proteins induce kinks in the filament and lead to the formation of short fragments that rapidly depolymerize or give rise to new filaments. The cytoskeleton is a network of microtubules created by the lateral association of protofilaments formed by the polymerization of tubulin dimers. While the plus ends of some microtubules extend toward the plasma membrane, Proteins stabilize the curved conformation of protofilaments from other microtubules, causing their rapid plus end depolymerization. Microtubules provide tracks so that transport. the membrane bound vesicles travel to ah. and from the plasma membrane. Look at that! The directional movement of these cargo vesicles is due to a family of motor proteins. That's, 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 that's a motor protein. <laughs> message that is inflamed to the white blood cell. Here, free ribosomes translate the mRNA molecules into proteins. So that you can fight off this infection. Some of these proteins will reside in the cytosol. Others will associate with specialized cytosolic proteins and be imported into mitochondria or other organelles. The synthesis of cell-secreted and integral membrane proteins is initiated by free ribosomes, which then dock to protein translocators at the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. We're trying to send a message here. Through an aqueous pore in the translocator, cells secreted accumulate in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, while integral membrane proteins get embedded in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. And it's going to make a whole bunch of those and put it out outside somewhere. Proteins are transported from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus by vesicles traveling along the microtubules. There's your markers. See all of them? Everywhere. So this thing's going to bind up with the um, cellular membrane. But here they're being modified by the Golgi apparatus. Protein glycosylation initiated in the endoplasmic reticulum is completed inside the lumen of the Golgi apparatus. Again, some of them being transported up after work is done on them. Fully glycosylated proteins are transported from the Golgi apparatus to the plasma membrane. When a vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, and once it fuses with the outside, contained in the vesicle, there you go. Are secreted. The alternates and markers vesicles membrane diffuse in the cell membrane. And that lets the white blood cell know secreted by endothelial cells positive to the extracellular domains of G protein coupled membrane receptors. This binding causes a conformation change in the cytosol and portion of the receptor. And the consequent activation of the subunit. The activation of the G protein subunit triggers a cascade of protein activation which in turn leads to the activation and clustering of integrins inside lipid rafts. A 
dramatic conservational change occurs in the extracellular domain of the activated hey, agent. Help, man. <laughs> this now allows for their interaction with ICAM proteins displayed at the surface of the endothelial cells. These strong interactions immobilize the rolling leukocyte at the site of inflammation. Additional signals will sound reorganization of the cytoskeleton, resulting in the spreading of one edge of the leukocyte. The leading edge of the leukocyte inserts itself the wall of your blood vessels, and the leukocyte migrates through the blood vessel wall into the inflamed tissue. Rolling, activation, adhesion, and transendothelial migration are the four steps of a process called leukocyte extravasation. Wow. I probably should have warned you before uh, you got into this stuff. So <laughs> that is the process by which your body signals to the white blood cells, which are part of your immune system, in your um, circulatory system and tells them, hey, we need help over here. Um, we got an infection or something, some kind of inflammation. Uh, it's, it's a feedback system. There's all kinds of signals and all kinds of, we call chemical signals, proteins that are made. Specific proteins at a specific time, at a specific place. How does it know to do this? Anyway, so <clears throat> that's, as far as we know, that's the limit of our knowledge on the complication of a single living cell. How long did it take us to figure all oh, that out? Um, your, your look, what we just saw in these two videos is a combined work of thousands of scientists wow. that have worked their whole lives for this. They didn't, they didn't make any food in that whole time. We, they, <laughs> we are so wealthy, we can pay them to do this for their whole lives. Whew. So, uh, Sometimes I just feel like God's showing off, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, make the statement that we have conclusively demonstrated that life only comes from life. And I'll go a step further and say that proteins only come from proteins. Uh, only proteins that have other proteins to help them and information from a genetic code and somehow know which proteins to make and which proteins not to make. And then you have to have a Golgi apparatus that knows how to modify the proteins in order to make the right kind of a specific type of protein in order to signal that you need help with. Good heavens, man. Uh. So, I think we've demonstrated proteins only come from proteins. Okay, now once you get to this point in the argument, believe it or not, there are folks out there who say, well, but once life is started, I mean, diversification is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Right? They will, they will admit that life coming from non-living things is impossible. So obviously the aliens brought it with them, you know. Uh, we'll talk about that next chapter, or maybe it's two chapters from now. Um, so we're just talking a little bit about the part of it that relates to microbi microbiology here in uh, this PowerPoint. Uh, you guys may have heard of Michael Behe. He wrote Darwin's Black Box. Highly recommended. Um, he's a microbiologist, okay? And they speak and all that stuff we just listened to. So he has sections of the book that are like that. You can read through them and understand 25%. I, that, at least that's me. I mean, maybe you know, you know more about microbiology than I do. Perfectly possible. Um, so I read through it and I'm like, ah, pretty much missed the whole thing there. Uh, basically, it's really complicated. Um, but then he has other sections of the book that are written in English, okay, at like an eighth grade level. So you can read through the book and kind of like, okay, all right, so this part, makes sense because, okay, you explained it up here. I'm not interested in that, but this part, this part does make sense. Um, so, Darwin's Black Box, great book, highly recommended. Um, he developed the concept of irreducible complexity in the late 90s. What in the name of logic and reason is irreducible complexity? Uh, this is the idea that some systems cannot be simplified. And I gotta tell you a story real quick. Um, there was once a toothpaste manufacturing company, right? Or a factory that made toothpaste. And they were, they were doing pretty good. You know, toothpaste sales are pretty steady, right? And they had one problem though, and that is that the machine that they packaged their toothpaste tubes in occasionally would make, would, would miss one and they would ship out an empty box. 
which is kind of a drag because then you've charged your retailer for a box of toothpaste that has no toothpaste in it. And the retailer is kind of bummed because he lost a tube of toothpaste. It's not really worth, you know, sending it back or, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just a drag, right? It's not professional. So a bunch of the, you know, really smart people that run the company get together and like, okay, we got to find a solution to this problem. What are we going to do? Well, they set a budget of a million dollars. True story. They set a budget of a million dollars to figure out a solution to this problem. They hire a consultant. They do all this investigation. And finally, they decide they're going to have a special sensor that weighs each individual box of toothpaste before it's put into the big box, right? And if it's too light, all these warning sirens will go off. The entire assembly line will shut down. And a worker will come and remove that box and you know just put it back in the rotation for you know to be filled. Okay, so they've implemented this system and it works great. They're you know they got a computer system set up to where they can figure out how many boxes are being um, you know stopped because they're too lightweight and you know they they have a complete success and they're very proud of themselves. And this goes on for a week and then all of a sudden they notice in their computer that they have no boxes, it's never stopping. The warning sirens are never going off and nothing, nothing is happening. This is, this is just like, okay, we had, we had this nice little steady stream of boxes that were too light and set off a warning siren and now we have none. <laughs> it's gone from that to zero. What is going on here? Um, so they check with the, the production guys and they're like, well, we haven't gotten any returns. We've got no complaints. And so then finally, the really smart guy goes and talks to the guy on the ground that actually does the work and talks to him. He's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, Bill, Bill over there, he got real tired of that stupid buzzer going off all the time and shutting everything down. So what he did, he set a box fan up right in front of that sensor and it just blows the, uh, the empty boxes off the assembly line into a little <laughs> basket he collects them at the end of the day, you know. <laughs> so there are a lot of systems that are not irreducibly complicated, okay? You can delete all kinds of stuff from a car, and it's still a motor vehicle, right? You can delete entire systems. Um, the radio is not an essential piece of equipment. It will still function as a car, as a car, if you delete the radio. Even the air conditioning. That would be very comfortable, but it is possible to survive a car with no AC. Bring lots of water. Don't expect to smell nice at the end of it, okay? So that's irreducible complexity. Um, so there are all kinds of systems that are not irreducibly complex. You can reduce them all, I mean, way down, and they will still function. A mouse trap is irreducibly complicated. Okay, you remove one of the five parts that make up a mouse trap, it no longer functions as a mouse trap. So that's what irreducible complexity is. Okay, now if we are going to increase or modify complex machinery that makes up a cell via mutation, which I think we have demonstrated via experiment, is it possible? But if it were possible, okay, we are going to have to be able to build these things via a series of small steps. Remember our little small steps across the canyon to get from point A to point B? You're gonna have to have fossil evidence for that, right? At least a few pieces of fossil evidence for it. Um, in this case, we got a fancy schmancy computer. We, could, we should be able to build a bridge from no microtubules to microtubules. How does, it, how does it work? Well, you ought to be able to demonstrate that. It shouldn't be that difficult, right? Each and every change must be beneficial so that the mutation survives. In bacteria, this isn't that difficult because they only have one copy of the information, right? So mutations are always showing up in bacteria. It doesn't have the option of having a good copy um, that's going to cover it up. Right? So, each of the steps has to be beneficial if the bacteria is going to survive. All right? We're going to look at the most famous example of irreducible complexity. Uh, that is the flagellum. You know, a flagellum is a fancy schmancy outboard motor that a cell will use, sometimes the cells will use, like a euclina, to get around. And there's this long filament that stretches way out over here. And this thing spins around, spins this propeller at a, up to 100,000 RPMs and transports the cell from place to place. It's an incredibly efficient outboard motor. 
And you got all these different proteins that are present here, about 40 different proteins that are present to make yourself a flagellum. If you remove one of the 40 proteins, it doesn't work as a motor. Okay? So I take this off, this universal joint, for example. Uh, you can spin this thing all day long, and it's just a rod out there spinning. It's not doing any good. Uh, you remove, you know, the bushing, destroys the cell. <laughs> uh, you get the idea. Any of these parts is missing, the whole thing goes kaput. Okay? So this would seem to be a case where you cannot get from point A to point B. All right? It is impossible for you to build a system where every step has been, and you gotta have 40 steps. Now we've demonstrated how difficult it is to build a single protein by random chance, right? So you have to do that 40 times in order to get from a bacteria with no flagellum to a bacteria with a flagellum. So you understand this is impossible, but you can't, you can't even get there. You can't even go from zero uh, proteins that are involved in a flagellum to a flagellum because you cannot build yourself a series of small steps to get from point A to point B because it doesn't work as a motor until you have 40 of them. So we are multiplying our problem about building proteins by a factor of 40. We have to take that whole jump at one time. See what I'm saying? Now, there are 10 of these proteins that are used in another structure, okay? Um, which we'll probably have some time about next week. We might be able to, we might be able to get to it. Let's see if we can go for it here. A scientist and senior <laughs> fellow at the Discovery Institute, Michael Behe is the author of the popular intelligent design book, Thyrosis. This is a machine that looks like it was designed by a human but that doesn't mean it was designed. That is the product of intelligent design. Indeed, this, is not my um, this <laughs> more has all the earmarks of something that arose by evolution. Really? Using an electron Do microscope, DeRosier produces ghostly pictures like this one, oh. revealing the inner workings of what's been called the world's most efficient motor. It's so beautiful. This is the drive shaft. This transmits this torque generated by the motor, that would then turn the propeller, Mr. which would push the bacterial cell through the fluid. Michael Behe has argued that the flagellum could not have evolved, since its parts have no function for natural selection to act on until they are fully assembled. Which is but true. But evidence that refutes Behe's claim of irreducible complexity comes from a tiny syringe that injects poison. Look, found in some of the nastiest of all bacteria. This is a structure found, for example, in Yersinia pestis, the bacterium that causes the bubonic plague. And Wonderful. look at the similarities. Now, this structure doesn't rotate, but it still has to extend this structure, which is equivalent to the rod, the drive shaft here. It has to extend that because it needs this little channel. It's like sort of like a syringe. So the the virulence factors that are made inside the cell, which is down here, can be exported, pushed up into this hole, and exported out through this long kind of needle, perhaps into a cell in your body or mine, and thereby create misery. And it turns out the two structures look similar for a reason. The syringe on the right is made of a subset of the very same protein types found in the base of the flagellum on the left. Though the syringe is missing proteins found in the motor and therefore cannot produce rotary motion, it functions perfectly as an apparatus for transmitting disease. So if we think about uh, what it means to be irreducibly complex, the argument is that if you take away even one of these proteins, that the structure uh, cannot function. Yet Which here is, true. is a structure that functions, that but is missing more. several of the proteins, and yet here it is, a working viable organelle of the bacterium. So indeed, this structure is not, in that sense, irreducibly complex. To emphasize DeRosier's point, 
Miller arrived at court making an unusual fashion statement. As an example of what irreducible <laughs> complexity means, advocates of intelligent design like to point to a very common machine, the mousetrap. <laughs> and the mousetrap is composed of five parts. It has a base plate, a catch, a spring, a little hammer that actually does the dirty work and a big hole. The mousetrap will not work if any one of these five parts are taken away. That's absolutely true. But remember the key notion. I think we've all been reading the same material. And that is that this whole machine is completely useless until all the parts are in place. That's not what we said, Bill. That turns out not to be true. And I'll give you an example. What I have right here is a mousetrap from which I've removed two of the five parts. I still have the base plate, the spring, and the hammer. Now, you can't catch any mice with this, so it's not a very good mousetrap. But it turns out that despite it is not parts, a mousetrap, it makes a perfectly good, if somewhat inelegant, tie clip. <coughs> okay. And when we look at the favorite examples for irreducible complexity, and the bacterial flagellum is a perfect example, we find the molecular equivalent of my tie clip which is we see parts of the machine missing two, three, four, maybe even 20 parts, but still fulfilling a perfectly good purpose that could be favored by evolution. And that's why the irreducible complexity argument falls apart. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> that's the kind of thing that I can only handle in small, small doses. Unfortunately, that guy, well, He knows exactly what he's doing, okay? This is a classic strategy of the progressives. They know they can't win the ball game. We just show them that they lost. So what they do is they move the goalposts. See, we still win. We said it's irreducibly complicated because you remove one of the 40 proteins and it does not function as a motor. So what did they do? They said, oh, well, we're gonna redefine irreducible complexity to mean that none of the parts are useful as anything. See what they did there? We said irreducible complexity means if you take away one of those parts, it is no longer a mousetrap, which is perfectly true. A mousetrap is irreducibly complicated. It fits that description. What did they do? They changed the definition of irreducible complexity to mean something totally different and said, see, see, you're wrong, you're totally wrong. And they get away with it because they have the media. It's no longer a mousetrap. But it's not a mousetrap. That's our whole point. We were trying to make, we were trying to have an intelligent conversation with these people. And the hilarious part about it is Michael B. He knew all that stuff and actually predicted it in his book. This is exactly what people are going to say about this. And I want you to know that the reason why it doesn't work is because I said it has to function as a motor. A, fl a flagellum is a motor. You take away one of those parts, it's not a motor anymore. You cannot build a simpler motor. Therefore, a flagellum is irreducibly complicated. Now, you can take those parts and build something else out of them. Like a tie holder. Like a tie holder. <laughs> okay. <sighs> they think they're so smart. They get away with it, though. They have control of almost all the media, almost all the colleges, right? They redefine irreducible complexity. They change the meaning of the words. How often do they actually do this? Go and change the meaning of words on us. Yeah. I almost think the day we believe in absolutes. Uh, so yeah, so they move the goalposts on us, and most of America is watching a fancy science show on the Discovery Channel. And they're like, oh yeah, I guess uh, I guess that does disprove it. No, it does not. Irreducible complexity stands. It has stood since the 90s. It will always stand. It, as far as we know, you cannot build a simpler motor than the flagellum. It is irreducibly complicated. You can take some of those same proteins and make yourself a syringe, but that's not relevant, really. Unless you have yourself a nice little line of 40 different structures, one at a time. Richard Bolton, this. I didn't hear him say that. He implied that he did, though, didn't he? Did you hear that? He was like, Oh, well, we find these things missing two or three or four, ten or twenty parts. Well, he's implying that he has this nice little lineup between point A and point B. Didn't he, didn't he just imply that? He implied it. He only has the one, though. He has the one step between 
zero and forty, and he's acting like um, you know he's just settled the entire argument. And, you know, don't give me in the same room with people like this. <laughs> All right, <laughs> just throw them in. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, they have the media. They get the last word. They're ignoring their own problem. They have one step out of the forty. Even by his own rules, he loses. Okay, we know better. We know that these proteins that make up the syringe and motor are not found elsewhere in the cell. We know how difficult it is to generate information to build a single protein. We also know that these structures have to be built in order. You cannot build the roof before the foundation is set. You must assemble the parts correctly and in order. All this information must be present for the, in order for it to work. That's why I conclude that the case for irreducible complexity is even stronger than the original case made by Dr. Behe because you have to build these things in a specific sequence. And, we, and again, we, we're just not even sure how the cell knows when, when to build certain things. Right, I've gone over a little bit. Any questions about that information? Pretty cool, huh? But we'll have to come back for the rest of it oh, next nice week. That's for sure. We'll, finish, we'll, we'll probably finish up this section next week. And we'll, we'll get into radioisotopic dating. <laughs> Surely that would be easy to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um.